The first bill on the calendar for today is Senate File 975. The clerk will report the bill. Senate File Number 975, number one on the calendar for the day, an act relating to higher education, the third engrossment. There are amendments at the desk. If there is no objection, we will let the author explain the bill before uh, we act on the amendments. Yes, uh, Representative Bernardi, as the chief author, I also see you have a DE author's amendment. Why don't we uh, move that first? Uh, I recognize the author uh, from Anoka, Representative Bernardi, who will explain the amendment. The clerk will report the amendment. The clerk will report the amendment. Bernardi moves to amend Senate file number 975. The third engrossment is follows. Delete everything after the enacting clause and insert the following language of House File Number 993, the second engrossment. The amendment is coded DEA 993. Do we want to adopt that amendment and explain it? Yes. Any discussion? Any discussion on the DE 993 amendment? All those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed aye. say no. No. The amendment is adopted. Uh, the motion is the motion is adopted and the amendment is adopted. The motion is approved and the amendment is adopted. To the author of the amendment, Representative Bernardi, who will explain the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. Today it is an honor to bring before you our higher education bill. I would like to first start out by thanking our committee members for the thoughtful, respectful, and engaging dialogue and contributions put into our committee and this bill. Vice Chair Christensen has been instrumental to our committee and a wonderful partner. I also enjoy working with Representative O'Neill and appreciate her constructive and thoughtful engagement as a Republican lead. Finally, our work would not be possible without our incredibly dedicated, talented, and hardworking staff. I want to thank our nonpartisan staff, fiscal analyst Ken Savory, and research analyst Nathan Hopkins, our committee administrator, Sean Herring, our committee legislative assistant, Jenna Mouse, our caucus researchers, Bennett Smith and Kelly Lehman, our media staff, Gina Vega. And I also want to give a shout out to our House Public Information Advisor's Office and the Chief Clerk's Office. Members, all Minnesota families deserve the opportunity to access a world-class education, no matter where they live or what they look like. This is why our higher education bill is investing more than $120 million in new funding to ensure that Minnesota students can recover from the unprecedented challenge they, challenges that they have faced over the past year. And everyone is ready to thrive as we move forward in the post-pandemic workforce. As we do each year in our Higher Education Committee, we came into the session looking to bring people with diverse voices and backgrounds to the table from across Minnesota. Students, parents, instructors, researchers, administrators, to name a few, joined us to share their experiences along with their hopes and dreams, challenges, and barriers. In an unprecedented year of a global pandemic, it is no secret our students have been hit especially hard. Together, we crafted a higher education budget that serves students and families now and in the future. We all deserve the opportunity to treat, achieve our dreams and provide economic security for ourselves and our families. We are investing in Minnesotans so everyone can thrive and emerge stronger post-pandemic. We had three key elements in mind as we put the bill together. These are supporting students' needs now and in the future, improving opportunity for all students using an equity lens, and ensuring we have a strong higher education system prepared to meet the needs of students post-pandemic. First and foremost, we are tackling the challenge of rising costs and student debt. We have made it a priority to freeze tuition at Minnesota State Colleges and University to ensure that students do not bear the economic costs of the pandemic. 
The bill goes even th th further to lower the cost of higher education by making new investments into the state grant program that will impact more than 75,000 students and expand access to over 3,000 grant applicants. We also recognize the cost of attendance is only part of the hardship students have faced in the past year. We heard moving testimony from students about their challenges this year and the need for more direct support for student health and wellness. This is why the bill makes new ongoing investments in mental health resources and aims to address food insecurity on our college campuses by incorporating the Hunger Free Campus Act. In addition, we have included ongoing investing investments in the Z degree program to help reduce the cost of textbooks and course material for students. We made a point of crafting this bill with an equity lens and have incorporated recommendations from the Select Committee on Racial Justice. Our committee was intentional about including measures that help address Minnesota's achievement and opportunity gap in higher education. We know that a core building block of student success is being able to relate to a teacher who identifies with their own lived experience and identity. Our bill includes increased investment to help train and educate more teachers of color and American Indian teachers. We work with advocates, the Office of Higher Education and Representative Keeler who carry this provision. We hope this increased investment can help move the needle to hire more teachers of color and from indigenous backgrounds in our state to better reflect the current student body of early childhood and K-12 classrooms. This bill makes a further investment in our classrooms by adopting Representative Pulowski's career and technical education pilot program, which will help train more career and technical educators who will be able to provide more Minnesota students with the opportunity to explore high demand career and post-secondary options while in high school. We also make critical updates to align the American Indian Scholarship Program with other Office of Higher Education scholarship programs that will qualify students for summer term awards and help them graduate faster with less debt. Finally, we have also included provisions from Representative Mariani's bill, which was created in collaboration with education ex equity experts from the Minnesota Education Equity Partnership. It requires the Office of Higher Education to research the work study program and also includes a new provision that requires the Office of Higher Education to provide data and report on the transfer movement of students who withdraw from enrollment without completing a degree or credential program. This will provide critical data to help us understand the challenges our students face when transferring or struggling to finish their degree. This bill also contains the Office of Higher Education Policy Bill, which passed with unanimous support in the Higher Education Committee. I want to specifically highlight a handful of key policy provisions we have included. We have extended the number of semesters that students can access the state grant if they need to take time off due to an illness or to care for a sick loved one. This is an important change that is only made more relevant by the current pandemic. The bill will also exempt any credits taken for developmental education from counting towards the credit limit for state grant to ensure a student's state grant eligibility is not adversely impacted by enrolling in courses that cannot be used towards graduation. As many of you may recall, in 2019, we heard devastating stories from Argosy students who nearly lost everything due to their college fiscal, mismanage fiscal mismanagement, which ultimately led to its abrupt closure. We worked hard this year to make sure this does not happen again by adding a number of provisions to the bill that will protect student consumers from harmful practices by for-profit colleges who act negligent. I want to uplift the bipartisan work that has been done over the last two years to continue addressing this crisis and thank members, staff, and most of all, the Argosy students who bravely shared their stories 
and worked with us to make sure future students will not have to go through the terrible situation they faced two years ago. Our higher education budget is student-centered with lots of good provisions that will provide critical support to our students now while delivering a brighter, equitable, and prosperous future for Minnesotans as we emerge from the pandemic. There are a few amendments, and I'm ready to take those amendments. With that, uh, Mr. Speaker, I stand for questions. There are amendments at the desk. Representative Mecklin offers the following amendments. The clerk will report the amendments. <clears throat> Mecklen moves to amend Senate file number 975, the third engrossment, as amended, and the amendment is coded A10. I recognize the author of the amendment, the representative from Sherburne, Representative Mecklen. Uh, thank you, Mr. S Mr. Speaker. Um, this amendment comes from a an email we got in the past week that the University of Minnesota Political Science Undergraduate Advising Department sent out an email to the students with a link to a safe protesting guide from BLM Seattle and a link to that, as well as a link for the Minnesota Freedom Fund, it, should they get arrested uh, while protesting. We all agree that our voices should and need to be heard. That's our, our God-given rights. But to advocate to do things that might get you arrested is a little bit concerning. The constituent of mine um, simply wants to get their degree and get a good job to pay off their tuition debt. Not necessarily um, be given advice how to, you know, not only evade police scrutiny or identification or, or any of it. Um, again, we all have our First Amendment rights. We, we, we totally agree with that. In, in the opinion of my constituent, this is not appropriate for the university to provide resources on how to protest, but it, it should be kept neutral from the taxpayer funded, you know, institutions of Minnesota that we do, we, 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 we implore them to, to teach our children well. Um, the university should be focused on preparing the students for their workforce and helping them secure the jobs so they can pay off their enormous debt that they are taking on to just get a simple degree and have a, a brightful future going forward. And, and that is the amendment um, that I am bringing forward. And with that, Mr. Speaker, I will withdraw the amendment. Thank you. Any further discussion to the A-10 amendment? Oh, okay, I should catch that. There's an amendment at the desk. <laughs> Representative Eklund, I'm sorry, Representative Meckland withdraws the A-10 amendment. There is an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Erickson moves to amend Senate file number 975, the third engrossment as amended, and the amendment is coded A-11. I recognize the author of the amendment, Representative Erickson, will you please explain the amendments? Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And yes, this is uh, a very important uh, amendment, and so I'd like to ask for a roll call, please. The roll call has been requested. Do I see 15 hands? Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. Uh, this is an amendment that provides funding for a nonprofit called Black Men Teach. This is an organization uh, across the nation, but in the Twin Cities, they have a new uh, an executive director, Marcus Flynn, who is really ambitious about moving forward the number of black men that we have in our classrooms, in particular our elementary classrooms, where we know it is so important to have a male teacher as those children begin their schooling. This is also a bill that Representative Cresha and I brought forth back in January uh, to the Higher Ed uh, Committee 
uh, but it never received a hearing. So today I am um, taking away a little money from the Office of Higher Education in the amount of 427000 to provide for more uh, teachers in this program. This program is like a grow your own. And Mr. Uh, Flynn, the new executive director, is really ambitious about recruiting. And so he finds young men and even older men uh, uh, from the African-American ancestry and urges them to consider enrolling in his program. This amendment would provide $427,000 to five school districts. This is also found in the K-12 finance bill at a, uh, an amount of $750,000 and would cover eight school districts uh, with uh, elementary schools or charters, elementary charters. So together, members, this could really be a great a way to get our, um, our black men in the classroom teaching our children. Um, there, uh, there is some accountability included in the amendment, and I think you can read that for yourself, but we do want to report back to uh, the uh, ranking uh, minority and chairs of our education committees that have jurisdiction over higher ed, uh, and uh, as far as that goes, K-12. And we want this report to describe the progress made toward this goal of increasing the number of black male teachers at each school site and strategies uh, that are used to do that. So members, I find it just really uh, encouraging as I read about um, one of the candidates uh, for this program who was enrolled at, at one of our universities and just found this calling to enroll in Black Men Teach, found that his major that he had in a major university just was not satisfying him. And as he looked around and saw what is happening among our, uh, our population, you know, we have between 65 and 68,000 teachers uh, in our state, uh, and, uh, you know, the percentage of those uh, who are of African American descent is so low that it's almost embarrassing. And in fact, among men, black men, it is just a little over 1%. So members, I ask for your support of this amendment so that we can grow this program, Black Men Teach in Minnesota, and bring uh, black men into the classroom to help our students to learn, and to learn from someone who looks like them, because the majority of these elementary schools will probably be in the metro urban area. And so this is something that we can do that will, will really bring relevance to our classroom. So I ask for your support, members. Further discussion to the A11 amendment. Representative Bernardi. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I rise up and oppose this amendment. The E12 bill already includes funding for this program, and we, need, we do not need to cut from this budget in order to fund this program. I ask members to oppose the A11 amendment. Further discussion to the A11 amendment. The representative from Wright, Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. So I would point out that we have increased in this budget $15 million over the base for OHI, for the Office of Higher Education. In fact, not only did we raise this $15 million, but I would point out that $314,000 above even what the governor had requested. So certainly there is room to support uh, black men and uh, mentorship and we, uh, on my side of the aisle, are really, really excited about this bill because of all the provisions for BIPOC and teachers of color. And this is just another movement in that direction. And we would really like the support of this. Uh, like I just told you, $314,000 is above what even the governor himself had asked for in this budget. So I would think that there's enough room to support this fantastic program. And I want to thank Representative Erickson for bringing this amendment forward and having such a passion for people of color. Thank you. And I ask for your green vote. Any further discussion to the A11 amendments? 
to the author of the amendment, Representative uh, Erickson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, I just would reiterate what I said earlier and ask for your support for a program that is so encouraging to our young black men to be in the classroom with our children. And remember, it isn't just uh, our African-American uh, children who like to have a teacher uh, who's different from uh, their skin color, for example, uh, but, you know, Every one of our students enjoys learning uh, from someone who is, uh, in fact, a little different from them. So I think this brings a great balance to our classrooms. Please vote yes. There is another member who would like to address the amendments. Uh, sorry, that was covered up by my papers here. Uh, Representative Frazier, Thank you, Mr. to the Speaker. A11 amendment, please. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, members, I am carrying the... Uh, the K-12 bill that is a part of the K-12 finance for funding. And I am very appreciative that Representative Dabney, Chair Dabney has included that financing. I will say that um, I've spoken with the with Mr. Forslund. I've also spoken with other members of the Black Men Teach Organization. Um, I've been aware of this organization and close with members of this organization before it had a board, before it had executive director. We're aware of the program and what it will mean to bring in Black male teachers into our classroom. As a black man, I'm also very well aware of what it means to have a black male teacher to head your class, to lead your classroom and the impact that it will have on the state of Minnesota. I'm gonna urge a no vote on this. The organization did not ask for this amendment. The organization is happy with the funding that is currently in the uh, K-12 finance bill. So I'm gonna urge a vote no on this. Thank you. Any further discussion to the A-11 amendment? Seeing none, the clerk will take the roll on the A11 amendment. For those members voting remotely, please vote. Will the clerk call the names of all those members who have not voted yet? Berg. Berg, no. Berg, no. Bliss. Bliss, I. Bliss, I. Carlson. Carlson, no. Carlson, no. Franzen. Yes. Yeah. Franzen, I. Green. Green, I. Green, I. Grossel. Grossel, I. Grossel, I. Hamilton. Hamilton, I. Hamilton, I. Hanson, R. Hanson R, no. Hanson R, no. Houseman. Houseman, no. Houseman, no. Heinrich. Heinrich I. Heinrich I, Katiza Watoon. Katiza Watoon, no. Katiza Watoon, no. Mariani. Mariani, no. Mariani, no. Mason. Mariani, no. Mason, no. Mason, no. McDonald. McDonald, I. McDonald, I. Munson. Munson, no. Munson, no. Nash. Nash, I. Nash, I. Swazinski. Swazinski, I. Swazinski, I. Tice. Tice, I. Tice, I. Thompson. Thompson, no. Thompson, no. Everybody. The clerk close the clerk will close the roll.
There being 57 ayes and 75 nays, the motion does not prevail and the amendment is not adopted. There is an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. O'Neill moves to amend Senate file number 975, the third engrossment as amended. The amendment is coded A3. The representative from Reich, Representative O'Neill, offer, um, I'm sorry, I recognize the author of the amendment, Representative O'Neill, who will explain the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. We have about $8 billion coming from the federal government soon and very soon to the state of Minnesota. Of that, about $2.7 billion is undesignated. That means we should be appropriating that money. And $552 million is a direct appropriation to the institutions of higher learning. So there's various within Minn State and the University of Minnesota and collectively they'll be getting $552 million. About half of that, we estimate, because we don't have full guidance yet from the federal government, will be going directly to help students, as it had been in the past. This is, I believe, the third package coming this way. But what this amendment does is out of that $2.7 billion coming from the federal government, it directs the commissioner of MMB to use those federal funds to cover eligible expenses in this bill and then cancel those expenses back to the general fund. It is something that I actually cannot take credit for. Chair Becker Finn actually came up with this idea and put it in her bill and we've seen those iterations in other bills since. And so this is really good policy and I actually did have a conversation just this morning with Chair Bernardi and uh, she actually has an amendment to make this even more clear. So, Mr. Speaker, I believe there is an amendment to my amendment. That is correct. There is an amendment to the amendment. The clerk will record the amendment. Bernardi moves to amend the O'Neill Amendment to Senate File Number 975, the third engrossment as amended. The amendment to the amendment is coded A12. I recognize the author of the amendment to the amendment, Representative Bernardi, who will explain the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I um, want to thank Representative O'Neill for this reasonable amendment, and I'm offering the 812 amendment to ensure that the federal funds that campuses will be receiving are kept separate. The federal assistance to campuses is intended for payment <sighs> assistance for costs directly related to the pandemic. Members, I ask you to support the 812 amendment. Any further discussion to the A-12 amendment? Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. I also ask for your support for this amendment to my amendment and then also to the underlying amendment. Thank you, members. This is good governance. Thank you. Any further discussion to the amendment to the amendment, the A-12? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed Aye. say no. Aye. The amendment to the amendment, the motion is approved and the amendment is adopted. To the underlying amendment, the A3, Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. This is just really good governance and I again ask for your support. And I would remind those that are watching on television and the governor that that $2.7 billion coming to the state of Minnesota really should be appropriated by the legislature because we are the branch that appropriates money. And so if we can continue to have that conversation and make sure the executive branch hears us and understands our desire to do that, we would like for that to happen. So I would point that out as I ask for your yes vote for this A3 amendment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. Any further discussion to the A3 amendment? Mm -hmm. Seeing none, oh. all those in favor of the A3 amendment say aye. 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 All those aye. opposed say no. The motion prevails and the amendment is adopted. There is an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. <clears throat> Daniels moves to amend Senate file number 975. 
The third engrossment as amended. The amendment is coded A5. I recognize the author of the amendment, the representative from Fillmore, Representative Daniels. Will you please explain the amendment? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. I'm um, actually from Fairball, so um, maybe put that in corrections. Um, I bring the A5 amendment uh, is to use our tax dollars in a more effective and efficient way by moving $1 million from the governor's recommendation for direct admission pilot program and use it for funding Minnesota Independent Community College, or MICC, which is an extremely successful college for people with autism. Although I think the intent of the governor's proposal has good intentions, it's not ready for prime time. And I would be happy to meet with the governor's team and look for a more workable and less expensive way to reach low-income students, students of color, indigenous people, and to, to help them to attend college. The $900,000 for a working group uh, does not seem like a wise use of tax dollars, and I think we can do better. I know that MICC has a proven track record of working with people that have autism. I've seen it firsthand, uh, the, the work that they do with these amazing people. They teach them life skills, like how to manage a checkbook, shop for healthy foods at the grocery store, prepare the food and teach them how to a uh, skill like housekeeping or culinary. Then they go from living in their mom's and dad's basement like, to an apartment where they live a full and independent life. And the best part is they love what they do and they are part of a team with a happy, promising future. I ask for a green vote and for your support and I do request a roll call. Further discussion to the a5 amendment. He requested a roll call. Oh, he did. Apologize. Uh, the roll call has been requested. Do I see 15 hands? Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. Further discussion to the A5 amendments. Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. Representative Daniels is being very humble, as he usually is. Uh, I've known him for a very long time, in fact, my entire life. <laughs> That's a little joke, you all know what that means. Uh, so when he goes to one of these graduations and one of these ceremonies with MICC folks, they just flock to him. They love to see him. And these people are just so excited. They do such a great job at MICC, and it gives great hope and great life and just a very happy and wonderful life for those folks. And I want to talk a little bit about the direct appropriations program that the governor has uh, asked that we carry. This is spending about a million dollars, members, about 900,000 of that for a working group to figure out how to send a letter to a high school senior in Minnesota to say, hey, guess what? You can go to a two-year Men's State College. That's all it does. We're spending a million dollars to tell high school seniors that they can attend a men's state two-year institution if they graduate or have a GED. Now, I've actually had members of this body reach out to me and say, I was a teacher and that, this is ridiculous. This is a ridiculous expenditure of money because guess what? They are already told that. And if they're not told that, I'm pretty sure Representative Cresha can figure out how to incentivize, without a million dollars, high school counselors to remind their seniors that yes, they fact, in fact can, upon graduation or getting a GED, be enrolled in a men's state two-year institution. We don't need a working group to figure out how to do this. We don't need an additional growth of government. And forgive me for sounding like Representative Draskowski for a minute, a minute, but we don't need to grow government to figure out how to tell high school seniors that you can go to a men's state institution. I you know, here's the thing. Here's a suggestion. This wouldn't cost a thing. Every single one of us in this room and across Zoom, every one of us members, all 134 of us, plus our 67 Senate colleagues, 201 of us, 
We all send letters, we're graduation letters to high school seniors. We could take care of this issue with no extra money whatsoever right here in this body. All you have to do in this room is admit, or I mean, excuse me, that you would agree to put in your graduation letter that you will tell high school seniors that if you graduate or get a GED that you can in fact enroll in a men's state two-year institution. Problem solved, give me the million dollars. This is a very uh, unfortunate program. This is a pilot program that absolutely does not need to happen. We could use a million dollars to help kids go to college. We could put it in a lot of other places. We could help these kids with autism, these adults with autism, have a better and happier life. There are a lot of uses for this million dollars. This is not one of them. Members, I ask you to support Representative Daniels' amendment. Uh, we ask for your green vote. And I think this might be the first time that my representative brother and I have done an amendment like this together. So there's another thing for history. Thank you all, and we ask for your green vote. Further discussion to the A5 amendment. Representative Bernardi. Representative, Representative Bernardi, Bernardi, you are muted. muted. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. This amendment would eliminate the new direct admissions initiative. Direct admissions will be a powerful tool for connecting low-income students and students of color and American Indian students who co with college enrollment opportunities. We can continue to support both Minnesota Independence College and Community and the direct admissions program. I ask members to oppose the A5 amendment. To the author of the amendment, Representative Daniels. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Representative O'Neill and Representative Bar Menard. Um, I, I would love to see this amendment pass. Um, I talked to the people at MICC, their program is scalable. So whatever new monies they get, they can actually get more students uh, through the program. There's a number of people waiting to use that program. And uh, I'll give you one quick story before I just uh, ask for a green vote. Um, at one of the graduations I was at, um, we were, um, uh, it was Representative Christensen and I were recognized for the funding for that. Uh, so after the program, this one gentleman uh, came up and I was sitting uh, you know, half the room away from him. And uh, he came up and he, and he talked to uh, Mr. Representative Christensen and myself. And he said, I just have to thank you for the funding. I'm moving my son out of my basement today. And he gave the old fist bump. And what more can you ask than to lift a family out where that child has no uh, communication, has no friends, has uh, nothing to look forward to, um, and then in three years' time, teach them the skills to live uh, financially and uh, cooking skills and find them a job and then live completely independently. And one thing I just forgot to mention is a number of years after they graduate, this has been uh, quite a few years, well, seven, eight years, um, these kids will actually look for an apartment close to the other graduates or sometimes in the same building. So uh, these kids go from no social life to, and I just found this out recently, uh, they meet on Fridays just to socialize. So a huge, huge advantage uh, for these chick children and kids that don't really have any type of a future. And uh, MYC gives them that, they give them that future. So. Again, I ask for your green vote, and I hope I can uh, uh, win your uh, trust with the program. It's really a fantastic program. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Chair Barry. There being no further discussion, the clerk will take the roll on the amendments.
Members voting remotely, please vote. Will the clerk call the names of all those members who haven't voted yet? Berg. Berg, no. Berg, no. Bliss. Bliss, I. Bliss, I. Bo. Bo, I. Bo, I. Franzen. Franzen votes yes. Franzen, I. Green. Green, I. Green, I. Grossel. Grossel, I. Grossel, I. Hamilton. Hamilton, I. Hamilton, I. Hanson, R. Hanson, R. No. Hanson, R. No. Houseman. Houseman, no. Houseman, no. Heinrich. Heinrich, I. Heinrich, I. Katiza, Watoon. Katiza, Watoon, no. Katiza, Watoon, no. Mariani. Mariani. Mason. Mason, no. Mason, no. McDonald. McDonald, I. McDonald, I. Munson. Munson, I. Munson, I. Nash. Nash, I. Nash, I. Swazinski. Swazinski, I. Swazinski, I. Tice. Tice, I. Tice, I. Zhang J. Zhang J, no. Zhang J, no. Mariani. Mariani, no. Mariani, no. The clerk will close the roll. There being 63 ayes and 69 nays, the motion does not prevail and the amendment is not adopted. There is an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Frankie moves to amend Senate file number 975, the third engrossment as amended. The amendment is coded A8. I recognize the author of the amendment, the representative from Washington. Representative Frankie, will you please explain the amendment? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Members, the A8 amendment takes $315,000 from the increase to the Office of Higher Education and gives it to the University of Minnesota. What this money would do was create a study about the negative health impacts of PFAS, or let's see if I can pronounce this right, members. Per and polyfluoral alkali substances. Um, for those of you who don't know, those are the forever chemicals forever chemicals that have been produced and um, dumped into our water systems. And uh, as I've heard uh, Chair Hansen refer to all the time, these are not going away. Um, so what I'm hoping to do is have the University of Minnesota do a study to um, reveal what possible impacts they, there are on us as human beings. Um, I would hope that Chair Bernardi would accept this as a friendly amendment, as this doesn't only affect my district, it affects many districts throughout the state of Minnesota and people all over our nation. Um, this money would help to create a system to where not only are we going to study the health impacts, but to create better understandings and ways of looking farther into the effects of this on people. So members, I'm really hoping that you can support this measure. Um, like I said, once again, this unpacks all of us. Clean water is an issue throughout my district and many of yours. And um, I'm hoping to get support on the AA amendment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, members. Further discussion to the A8 amendment. Representative Bernardi. Representative, you are muted. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We, um, this amendment is unnecessary. 
the University of Minnesota and the Department of Health are already working on this research. This would be an expensive and unnecessary layer of oversight in that work. We've heard from the University of Minnesota that it would be unnecessary for them to review work that they are already involved in. I ask mem members to oppose the amendment. The representative from Washington, the rep representative Jurgens. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and, and thank you, Representative Frankie, for bringing this forward. Uh, Representative Frankie and I uh, represent Cottage Grove together, and not just in Cottage Grove, but in the surrounding area. This has been a huge issue, as many of you know. Uh, I've been in town hall meetings where uh, residents are in tears. Uh, a young mother who, holding a baby, not sure if she should be able to nurse that baby if she's been drinking the water in the Cottage Grove area because of PFAS. Uh, I think this is very necessary, a very necessary amendment. Uh, I think people need answers. They want to know the long-term uh, effects on PFAS, and it's 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 a a growing concern throughout the state of Minnesota, not just in our district. So I would urge members to vote yes on the Frankie Amendment. To the author of the amendment, Representative Frankie. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, Representative Jurgens, for your support. And thank you, Chair Bernardi, for the discussion. Um, I would have to say that I did reach out to the university and I was not told that they are doing this. And I guess my response would be that um, everything that we can do to make sure that we are providing for the safety of our citizens, um, kind of piggybacking on what Representative Jurgens was saying, you know, you don't understand the impact that it has on people until you meet them. And one day when I was out door knocking, I was talking to a young mother who had issues conceiving and she was scared to death on whether or not this was because of the water we are drinking over here. So when it comes to providing money or funds to study this and the health impacts that it's having, um, everything that we can do to make sure that we are providing for the safety of the clean water in our my area and yours, I think is warranted. So with that members, I urge your support. Thank you. There being no further discussion, all those in favor of the amendment say aye. 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 All those opposed say no. Aye. No. no. Oh. The motion does not prevail and the amendment is not adopted. There is an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. <clears throat> Haley moves to amend Senate file number 975, the third engrossment as amended. The amendment is coded A9. I recognize the member from Goodhue, Representative Haley who offers the following amendment. If you could please explain the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. Uh, my amendment puts a work requirement uh, as an attachment onto students who receive our state grant scholarship programs. Uh, I am a very a strong supporter of the Minnesota State Grant Program. As of June 2020, 80,000 students are receiving these grants. And they could be in two-year schools, public or private institutions, or four-year schools. And this bill we have before us today increases our funding to this valuable program. But I think there's one thing missing. Um, those of you who have worked with me uh, know that I am a proponent of accountability in government. And since I came to the legislature, I also talk often about measuring what we do and being very intentional about the outcomes we want with the policy that we put in place. Uh, lastly, it's important, I think, that we link what we do in our education system, especially with our higher ed institutions, to what our state's workforce needs are. Right now, we have an interesting combination of uh, people that are out of a job due to the COVID pandemic, while we have many, many companies facing workforce shortages, whether it's manufacturing or IT or healthcare. Uh, I looked up the other day, I think we have 500,000 positions open in various healthcare related fields. So I think it's very, very good governance that we tell folks that we are helping to get through school to upskill or reskill and get an education, that we want them to work in Minnesota. Not only do we want them, we need them here. 
And folks, um, if we don't get creative about some of these uh, requirements, um, we're going to fall behind. In Representative Rod Hamilton's district, he represents Worthington, Marshall, and Laverne. They're border cities to South Dakota. In South Dakota, Amazon and Schwann's are building new facilities that will require 1,600 new employees. 1,600. And so what South Dakota has done is if you receive a scholarship for a two-year education in South Dakota, you are required to work for three years in that state. And you can imagine for young people, you know, when they, if they go to school and they graduate and they get a job, you quickly plant roots. Maybe you get married, you make friends, et cetera. So once those roots are planted and you're started in that career, it's more than likely the place that you're going to stay and work and raise a family and build your future. So we need to be doing this in Minnesota. Uh, I think it's good governance. I think it shows accountability to taxpayer dollars. Uh, so I really would encourage everybody to support me in this amendment, and I would appreciate your yes vote. Further discussion to the A-9 amendments. Representative Bernardi. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I work with Representative Albright to help incorporate one of Representative Haley's ideas on workforce development scholarship into the higher education budget. But I ask members to oppose the A-9 amendment. This amendment would increase the cost of college for students and continue to saddle students and their families with more student debt at a time when the cost of college is already significant challenge. Minnesota students and their families are already burdened with the cost of student debt. Punishing these students and their families just because their loved one found work in another state is counterproductive and will only serve to harm Minnesota families and students. I ask members to oppose the A-9 amendment. Further discussion to the A-9 amendment. The representative from Travers, Representative Backer. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we see with my district next to South Dakota, I have had classmates of even of my daughter's class who took advantage of that. Um, it's a wonderful program. We have a lot of people that goes to Watertown Technical School. They um, take the class that they want, if it's welding, construction, nursing, and then they stay in Watertown, South Dakota, or someplace in South Dakota. So that means we have young Minnesota students, people who are willing to take risks, people who want to better their lives, staying in South Dakota. They are not importing back into Minnesota. We are exporting our students into South Dakota. People that we want to stay in Minnesota, especially in West Central Minnesota, up and down that border, and so forth. So it's already happening. So if we don't make these changes, you know, I've learned a long time, we can't figure everything out, but if something's working for another state, let's do what they're doing. This is working for South Dakota. I've seen it several times, students coming out of schools in the District 12A that I represent, and they're staying in South Dakota. Representative Haley is 100% correct. They get roots in South Dakota. They stay in South Dakota. They marry in South Dakota. They raise families in South Dakota. And we're losing that tax base. This is just a common sense bill. And I rise to support this great bill from Rep this great amendment from Representative Haley. Thank you. To the author of the amendment, Representative Haley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Chair uh, Bernardi, for uh, your partnership on other issues in this bill. Um, but I would like to remind members, I have multiple provisions in the amendment that account for if somebody, there's hardship, or if they go on to graduate school, or if it takes them longer to finish their degree, things like that. Um, and you need to know, when we talk to employers all over the state, they frequently say their number one concern is the lack of workers. Their number one concern of the issue that will hamper their growth in this state is their ability to get workers. And I would also like to point out that we have this provision in many of our uh, other areas where we provide um, loan forgiveness. For example, in our teacher programs, 
and in other programs where we're, we're seeking doctors or other specific type of training, uh, we have loan forgiveness provided that those folks, when they get trained, work in areas of our state that need those workers. So this is not an uncommon practice. I would appreciate your yes vote. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, members. There being no further discussion to the amendments, all those in favor of the A-9 amendment say aye. 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 All those aye. opposed aye. say no. Aye. 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 The motion does not prevail and the amendment is not adopted. Members, there are no further amendments at the desk. The clerk will give the bill its, uh, I'm sorry, there are no further amendments at the desk. The bill, the clerk will give the bill its third reading. Third reading, Senate file number 975, as amended. Third reading. Representative Claiborne. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. I rise today in support of the Higher Education Bill, Senate File 975. Thank you, Chair Bernardi and members of the Higher Education Committee for your commitment to our work and for our enlightening debates. They were critical in coming to a good bill today. This bill addresses many critical needs of our students, our public education institutions, and our state related to research and innovation. I'd like to acknowledge the importance of the University of Minnesota to our communities across our state, educating our future leaders, conducting pioneering and groundbreaking research, and driving these benefits and knowledge into communities all around Minnesota. The University of Minnesota is charged with the responsibilities of education, research, and extension. From the university's innovative research and contribution to COVID testing strategies, extension offices and research and outreach centers, to community health clinics and testing sites for aquatic invasive species, the University of Minnesota students, staff, and alumni are living in and contributing to communities in every corner of our state. Together, they create a nearly nine billion economic impact for Minnesota each year with a long history of success and a promising future ahead. The funding in this higher education legislation will ensure the university remains an affordable and accessible education institution for all Minnesotans. It will propel additional research and extension work in areas of natural resources and sustainability, health sciences, and my favorite, food and agriculture. This bill further enables the University of Minnesota for the first time ever to truly drive forward a systemic strategic plan with transparent benchmarks and metrics available for all Minnesotans, providing transparency on how funding is allocated and prioritized. In closing, keeping the University of Minnesota strong, it's beneficial for our state. Thank you, Chair Bernardi, for your commitment to strong public higher education. Mr. Speaker and members, I ask for your support for this important legislation. Please vote yes on Senate File 975. Thank you. The representative from Clay, Representative Keeler. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. Um, this is something that's really close to me. Um, I stand in front of you all, as I do every day, um, unapologetically indigenous. So what I can tell you is we're talking about higher education, and my education experience is vastly different than all of yours. Both Representative Her and I have never seen teachers or professors who look like us at the front of a classroom. So that changes our experience. Representative Erickson, I'm really pleased to hear you stand up in favor of the importance of having teachers that look like all of us. This is not just important for teachers or for students like us, it's important for our next generation. Education is the foundation of the hope we have in our next generations. 
So I appreciate Chair Bernardi, this committee, our staff, and the work we've been able to do across the aisle to have honest, real conversations around the investment of representation. Representation matters. I've worked really hard with stakeholders and community members to, in, to work on our Increased Teachers of Color Act. What this does is it provides a way past the barrier that a lot of us see in education. We provide scholarships for aspiring teachers. I don't know about you, because I didn't have a chance to look up all of your districts, but I know in my district, we serve 36% minority students and we only have 1% minority teachers. Our teachers need to look like the kids in our classrooms. What this does is it also provides grants to support our teachers while they're doing their student teaching. So many of us talk about our experiences as teachers or educators, and that's one of the hurdles that we get to actually graduating and getting in the classrooms. Barriers are real. One of the data points I want to share with you is that as an indigenous person, only 7% of my population holds a bachelor's degree. Yet your population holds 36% uh, of bachelor's degree. That's a barrier. That's real data. That's why we need to do this work. So I appreciate the, the work that we've done to increase our teachers of color, um, and I look forward to growing that pilot program. The other thing I do is I stand in front of you as a double dragon. Um, I hold my bachelor's and my master's from MSUM. One of the things that I learned there is grit, humility, and heart. So it's so much more than just academics that we're learning in this experience. It's learning how we go out into the world and be better people. Minnesota State Colleges and Universities are impacting 54 campuses across Minnesota, two of which are in my community. This helps us plant the seeds to have growth, and I agree we need to do better at keeping our individuals in our state, but we have to have a state that's welcoming and affirming to all. The other programs in here that I know I and others have benefited from are programs like the American Indian Scholarship and Child Care Grants. So I appreciate the continued investment and understanding that not everybody has an easy road through education and that all of this is important. Education should not be a privilege for some. It needs to be an opportunity for all. I encourage all of you to vote green. Thank you. The representative from Wright, Representative McDonald. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I just wanted to comment on the House File 380, Representative Palowski's provision, uh, technical education. I uh, served on the committee and uh, very, very important committee and it's gonna be a great program. I just had wished that Representative, Representative Palowski, we could have find the uh, appropriations for statewide. So this provision will help teach uh, educators to help teach industrial education. As you are all aware, I'm sure, we have a huge shortfall of trained, skilled labor those in uh, the industries of construction and plumbing and heating and air conditioning and, and uh, uh, mechanics and building. And uh, you go through the newspapers and there's one ads, one after the other after the other. Not everybody is suited for a four-year college. I think we all recognize that and completely understand. There's so many great trades and great careers for people and different pathways for those to uh, learn and to grow and to find a great career, a good money-making career with no few debt whatsoever. So Representative Palowski's uh, uh, Provision 380 uh, will be a great pilot program, but I look forward to working with he and all of my fellow legislators and uh, finding a great solution to get technical education back to our schools and teach uh, our students that there are different pathways to uh, success and to careers good skilled labor, and we truly need it. Now more than ever, in every school, we need to bring back welding, mechanics, and uh, construction, and woodworking back in our schools. So uh, I do support this provision in the bill, and I thank Representative Palowski for the good work that he did uh, in that committee, and look forward to future, future uh, work on uh, this career path for our young adults and young students. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The representative from Hennepin, Representative Davney. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. Uh, representative Bernardi, congratulations on a strong bill, 
to build opportunity for Minnesota students across the state. I wanted to take a moment and speak specifically to the automatic enrollment policies. Representative McDonald was just talking about the importance of a skilled workforce. And the automatic enrollment policies that Chair Bernardi included in her bill help deliver that to opportunity to Minnesota students and those skilled workers to Minnesota's economy. Across the country currently, we're seeing significant reductions in the number of students taking advantage of post-secondary opportunities, whether it's our, at our two-year or four-year colleges and universities. We also know that Minnesota is amongst the lowest states in the country in the proportion of school counselors to students. I think we've managed to make it from 49th place in the country all the way to 48th. So relying on school counselors to have the time to meet with every student, to assess them, to get to understand their, their priorities and their hopes and their dreams and not connect them to those, to not recognize that automatic enrollment policies are currently exist in about 15 states, in Florida, Mississippi, Texas in the South, Kansas, Missouri, and Idaho in the West, Arizona, Colorado, Idaho, and our own neighbors in Iowa and South Dakota. Because they recognize that that letter arriving at the house saying you've been admitted into this college and this college and this college, all you have to do is apply, can open doors to opportunities for those children, those students, and Minnesota. I encourage a green vote on the bill. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The representative from Hennepin, Representative Knorr. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker and members. Uh, you have heard several times about workforce development today. I just wanted to begin by thanking the members of the Higher Education Committee, the nonpartisan staff, and the partisan staff that we have. Given the pandemic and the economic situation we are in, higher education investments we are making today are going to be critical to get economies back on track. Members, our students know what they want. They want access to higher, high quality education that will set them on the right path to success. They want higher quality education that will help them thrive, support themselves and their family and contribute to their communities. It's more than just a dream. It transforms the students' lives and shapes their future in a profound, positive ways. This bill focuses on cost and debt that the students face. It focuses more on outcomes and opportunities. Opportunities like the Summer Academic Enrichment Program that provides students from low-income families and also students of color an opportunity to participate in a higher post-secondary education program so that they can keep up, catch up and thrive, especially given the pandemic, so that the students who have been falling behind because of the COVID-19 pandemic, which I always say our students have been adjusting to the situation they were in, this is an opportunity for them to take advantage of a great program that will help them succeed. Members, we do have an obligation to ensure that we provide access to high quality education to everyone. We need to dismantle some of the challenges that we're facing. We need to look into equity. We need to look into outcomes that provide an opportunity for everyone. No matter where you live, where you come from, who you look like, this is a moment. This is a moment that we have to think about the future for our state. Members, the, the decisions we make today define our generation. Let us step up and give that opportunity to every student 
so that we have an opportunity to allow everyone who needs to go to college can have that access. And this bill is a first step in doing that. So I ask you to vote green on this bill. Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker and members. The representative from Scott, Representative Albright. Thank you, Madam, Ch uh, Mr. Chair, Mr. Speaker. Members, this bill is about our future work workforce and the industries that it will spawn. I think we can all agree that knowledge and that attendant innovation has powered our state over years in, in, most, in many areas as well as in many new industries. It's very, therefore, in my opinion, imperative that we include all Minnesotans as we work to provide opportunities for everyone to improve their lives through a higher education. You know, making sure that there is access to either a two-year, a four-year, or a trade program, I think will ensure a bright future for our state's workforce. As it's been said, a well-educated populace ensures our state is a leader in research and development as well as job creation and economic prosperity. I think it's also uh, poignant that as we emerge from the COVID-19 pandemic, we need to ensure a robust economic recovery and that comes by funding and supporting our higher educational institutions. The emphasis on workforce development that is included in this bill ensures that we will have a well-trained workforce, as well as a strong class of aspiring entrepreneurial talent emerging in the coming years. I was very proud to co-author with Representative Pulowski, the Career and Technical Education Pilot Project, which is included in this bill. There are so many rewarding and high paying jobs that do not require a four year degree. And even more importantly, we need to provide the opportunity for people to teach those folks that aspire to work in the trades. Working on programs to support the trades, in my opinion and, and others that are sharing it is essential to make sure that every Minnesotan is able to earn a living, support their families, and thrive in their communities that they serve. Members, there are certainly provisions in this bill that some might find uh, objectionable, but I'm confident that as it comes back from conference, it will have been improved to the satisfaction of many. In the balance, I believe this bill moves our state forward in a very broad, diverse and positive manner that will ensure every Minnesotan has the opportunity to create for themselves the life of their choosing. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The member from Wabasha, Representative Draskowski. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I would ask if the higher ed chair would yield, Mr. Speaker. Yes, I will. Mr. Speaker, I will yield. She will yield. Representative Dreskowski. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, thank you, Representative Bernardi, for yielding. Um, Representative Bernardi, I see yes, in the spreadsheet can. for the bill that it increases spending in higher ed for Minsk or Minnesota State and the U of M uh, and the other elements of the bill. A uh, total of 125 million for the upcoming biennium and another 150 million in the out biennium. I don't see any discussion in the spreadsheet unless I missed it, but certainly you would know how much additional money did each of these two higher ed institutions or organizations receive from the federal government uh, under the guise of coronavirus uh, since the last bill was written. Representative Bernardi. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker and uh, Representative Drazkowski. Those uh, bill, though, the funding that has gone to them has gone, half of the funding has gone directly to the students and half to the institutions. And they have been using that to 
try to mitigate their costs because of COVID and that those funds have not covered the cost at this point of their COVID related expenses. Representative Dreskowski. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, would uh, Representative Bernardi continue to yield? Uh, she will yield. Representative Dreskowski. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So thank you, Representative Bernardi. Um, but the question is how much money, federal money was delivered to these two higher ed institutions in the state of Minnesota? Representative Bernardi. Mr. Speaker, we do not have the guidance on the uh, full package of the different packages that have come to the, that are coming to the institutions. Representative Dreskowski. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Representative Bernardi. Well, I find that troubling. We have a, a bill that sp spends an additional hundreds of millions of dollars above the base. I don't even have the actual numbers to be able to compute the amount of money that it spends above the amount that was spent or is projected to be spent in the current biennium, which is gonna be even a greater increase um, than is re reflected in the spreadsheet we talked about earlier. Additionally, we don't even know how much money, or at least the chair of the committee doesn't know how much of the money uh, that these two institutions receive from the federal government which if we look at the other areas of state government, certainly in the education area, K through 12, uh, and state government as a whole, uh, we're looking at billions of dollars that came to this state, but we don't know how much the U of M or Minnesota State received or truly where it went. Uh, I find that troubling that uh, Mr. Speaker and uh, Chair Bernardi that we don't know. We should have that information here before us when we're planning to uh, forward, a, I'm trying to remember, $3.5 billion spending bill uh, on to the next point in the process. I don't think that's good decision making. I don't think that's providing or understanding the information uh, that is necessary and that uh, is, uh, is, is responsible or would re reflect a responsible behavior amongst us as individual legislators or as a body. Uh, that's really the extent of my comments. Thank you, Representative Bernardi, and thank you, Mr. Speaker. The representative from Sherborne, Representative Wilgamont. Mr. Speaker and members, I rise today on behalf of the students that I represent at St. Cloud State University, the students that I represent at St. Cloud Technical and Community College, and every one of the roughly 425,000 students who attend a college or university in the state of Minnesota to urge your green vote for the House Higher Education Finance Bill. Mr. Speaker, too many students in our state are denied a higher education opportunity because of skyrocketing tuition costs, unreasonably unaffordable textbooks, and the gnawing pangs of hunger. Members, that's why I'm asking for your green vote on this version of Senate File 975 that is before us. Members, your green vote will prevent hikes in tuition for students in the Minn State system. Your green vote will fund the Hunger Free Campus Act, which will provide grants for campuses who are seeking hunger free campus designations by connecting students with food resources, strengthening on campus food pantries, and raising awareness to help reduce the stigma that is all too often associated with hunger and asking for help. Members, your green vote for this bill will expand the Z degree textbook program, which will save students and families money by helping develop zero cost textbook courses and creating opportunities for faculty to customize their curriculum. Mr. Speaker and members, let's make sure our students can focus less on their pocketbooks and more on their textbooks. Let's give Minnesotans a chance to achieve their dreams through quality, affordable higher education. Let's vote green on this version of Senate File 975. Thank you, Chair Bernardi. Thank you, members, and thank you, Mr. Speaker. The representative from Wright, Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. And I wanna thank Chair Bernardi because this has been a really difficult time. It was just over a year ago that we all kind of got out of Dodge and left St. Paul and we didn't know what was gonna happen because of COVID. And we have had ups and we've had downs and it's been really challenging. And 
This is one of the first days where I've seen this many people in the chambers. I feel like we're finally winding this down and coming to an end. But through it all, I have to say that working on the Higher Ed Committee with Chair Bernardi has been a joy. And why do I say that through all of these tri trials and tribulations and difficulties? Because she is a woman of honor and of dignity and of grace, and it was a joy to work with her. I wish she was on the floor right now so that I could actually see her as I'm speaking about her. But every time I raised a question, which anyone that served with me in committee knows I raise a lot of questions and concerns, and I, I don't make it up just because it's fun to do, it's because it's something that needs to be said and it's issues that need to be addressed. And each and every time I would do that, the bill would change in that direction, and she would listen to those concerns. And for that, I am incredibly grateful. Let me just give you a bit of perspective on the higher ed bill. As Representative Draskowski just pointed out moments ago, it is a $3.5 billion budget item. $3.5 billion. I just want to put that in perspective for those listening at home out of a $51, $52 billion budget. We're not quite sure where we're going to land. That's actually more than the entire judicial branch of government. $3.5 billion is more than it takes to fund the entire judicial branch. It's more than the public safety. So think about all of what's going on in public safety today, yesterday, tomorrow, who knows, next week. That's a lot of money. And it's important. It's something that we here in Minnesota have prioritized. We feel that this is incredibly important. And as we deliberated and discussed things in the higher ed committee, that came up repeatedly. And I, and I have to point out something else. Representative Keeler is one of our new freshmen, and I really appreciated her words in committee. And she is one of our few Native American members, and she is a treasure to the state, I have to say. And I really do appreciate her perspective when it comes to being educated here in Minnesota. And part of why I say that is because of where I grew up. And I say this once in a while, I grew up in Clearwater County, so that is near Monoman. So I, I like to say that I kind of grew up in the middle of three reservations on all sides of me, and many of my classmates were Native. And I, you know, when you grow up like that, you just think that's the way it is. But when I think about it through that lens, as Representative Keeler was discussing her education and her experience, I don't remember any of my teachers being Native American. I do remember an elder, I, I remember this so clearly, it was an elementary school, and I remember a, an elder woman came in to teach us some beadwork, and it was, and to teach us a little bit of Ojibwe. It was exciting, I thought it was fantastic. But honestly, I don't remember a single teacher, and maybe I'm missing some, but I don't remember a single teacher that was Native. So one of the components of this bill I find so in, encouraging and exciting and worth putting in is the whole package of increasing teachers of color. And I say that with an absolute sincere heart. I think that this is the absolute right direction to go for the state of Minnesota. The only unfortunate thing is, you know, we have a limited amount. We had, even though we had $120 million over base, uh, the ask that came in, so it was a great presentation, and the ask that came in was $26 million, and we were only able to do $4.5 million. Hopefully in the future we'll be able to do more than that. And it was pointed out that that $26 million would only move the needle about 1% of our teachers in the direction of people of color, of teachers of color. So that really puts it in perspective. That's a really good initiative in this bill. There was um, some small changes to the dual training program, which I think are really good too. And it's actually reverting it back to the bill that I wrote in 2015. And I had, it had some changes throughout the years, but it's, it's kind of reverting back to a lot of the components that former Senator Terry Bonoff and I worked on back in 2015. It also strives, something that back when I was on higher ed before as the vice chair, strives to better balance the two systems that we have here in Minnesota, the Min State system that we support, and of course the University of Minnesota system. And in this bill, Min State, Minnesota State gets $68.6 .6 million, where the U of M gets $41.75 million. So 
a little bit less. And why is that important? Well, if you look at the size of each of those institutions, men's state serves, if you look at if if you looked at everybody as like a full-time equivalent student, it's about 112, 113 thousand, not people necessarily, but the equivalent of a full-time person. And the University of Minnesota typically serves about 60,000, so right about half or so. But if you look at the total amount of money, even today, that these two systems get, they're not really in proportion, not in proportion with the number of students they serve. The men's state system gets 1.6 billion and the U gets 1.4, so it's very little difference. There is a little bit of difference in this bill, which I do appreciate, but I think that we need to think about those systems in a little bit different way. Something else in this bill that seems really great on the surface, members, is the tuition freeze for students for the men's state system, which sounds like a fantastic idea, but here's the, the, uh, the back side of the, like the back door, the back side of this is that we're not freezing any of the fees or increases of any other sort, just tuition. And you know, if you've been around higher ed at all, you understand that there's really only two buckets of money for men's state. It's what the state provides, what we'll be providing today moving forward, and tuition. They don't really have any other options. They may have very, very small pockets of money, I, I should say, maybe small revenue streams, but they're very, very small and insignificant. But by and large, Men's State has two buckets. And if we freeze the one bucket, I'm not quite sure how they react to that and how they respond, but my guess is that because we haven't specifically said not to raise fees, that they will have to do that. So although on the surface that seems like a great thing for students, I don't think that the net effect will be what you want. I've spoken before about the direct admissions pilot program. We're growing government to tell seniors in a letter, hey, you can go to Men's State to your university if you graduate or get a GED. Now out of the one million dollar appropriation to create this program, $925,000, so all but $75,000 of that is just to figure out how to do this. It's for a working group, it's for the IT, you haven't put a single letter in a single hand of a single senior in the state of Minnesota for $925,000 out of the $1 million appropriation. You've just created more government, is all you've done. I'm kind of surprised that Representative Drazkowski, when he came on, didn't talk about that, because it's totally in his wheelhouse. But maybe he'll speak some other time about it. The last thing I think that's uh, important in this bill that we need to talk about is the lack of funding. There's a small amount, but not nearly enough for the mental health services of students. And I can tell you we had at least two full days of students come in that I recall, and one after another talked about the mental health challenges going through COVID and the struggles that they had while they are on campus or trying to do virtual learning. It is devastating to them. And I know that the mental health of all of us has really suffered, but them in particular, because they are no longer close to their friends and, and they were just really struggling to get classwork done. And so I feel like this bill, even though it's $120 million over base, doesn't quite go far enough to fund mental health counselors on campuses, particularly at Men's State. And when I had a long conversation with faculty at Men State, it was uh, something that the faculty said to me multiple times, there's just not enough mental health counselors on campus. And the administration expects the students to just go somewhere else, go, go to somewhere in the community, and they said, and there's not enough of that either. So I'm, I'm disappointed that some of that $120 million did not go to fund additional mental health counselors on campuses at Men's State. Then the last thing is the $552 million coming from the federal government. While we don't have exactly the parameters around that, we know that probably half of that will go directly to students and 
Men's State and the University of Minnesota is just sort of a pass-through entity and they just send that money on. But a good portion of that will actually stay in each of those institutions. So it's really hard to do a budget, members, when $552 million is coming from the federal government and you have no idea where it's going to go or what you're going to do with it. So that is a big question mark, I believe, in this bill. And as much as I would like to vote yes for this bill, as so many things had been addressed throughout the process, I'm actually going to be a no vote today for the reasons I just said about particularly the direct admissions program, the lack of mental health counselors and funding for that, the tuition freeze, it doesn't actually freeze the, the fees, and so the cost for students will probably go up. I don't know how else they're going to do it. And also, at the University of Minnesota, we did not address the administrative overhead and cost. There wasn't a single conversation about it, and there's nothing in the bill to, again, curtail the University of Minnesota administrative expenses, which makes it exceptionally more difficult for students to go to college there. But I do want to thank Chair Bernardi and for her collaborative work. And I'm hoping that after it comes back from conference committee, it will be a bill that I can support. But at this time, I am going to be voting no. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. The representative from Robichaux, Representative Dreskowski. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, thank you, members. Um, Mr. Speaker, I'm still troubled by the fact that we don't have a lot of information on this federal money. Um, and thank you, Representative O'Neill. Uh, you actually have the number in your head and maybe on paper too, I don't know. Um, I hope that we can have a discussion about those dollars or maybe a discussion about the absence of the information about them, or maybe we can actually come up with information about them. Um, I'm, I'm wondering, Mr. Speaker, would the Ways and Means Chair yield? Will the Chair of Ways and Means yield for a question? Mr. Speaker, do I have the floor or do you? Uh, we're waiting to hear from Representative Moran, but um, Representative Dreskowski, if you want to proceed. Okay, thank you, Mr. Speaker. While we're waiting on Representative Moran, um, I want to uh, reiterate something that uh, Representative O'Neill said, and uh, that is I have the same um, really uh, affinity for um, the type of uh, approach that Representative Bernardi brings not only to her chairmanship, of uh, which I haven't had the pleasure of uh, uh, experiencing, but uh, as a member serving with her, I know exactly uh, the grace with which uh, Representative O'Neill talked and I concur with that. So thank you, Representative Bernardi, even though I'm not gonna vote for your bill. Um, I, I, uh, I appreciate you as a, as a colleague, uh, the approach, you're very approachable and um, just a, just a, just an up, upfront uh, great person. So I, I really appreciate that. Um, Representative, Representative O'Neill, I agree with you uh, on the waste of money that is in this bill. Uh, we graduate seniors from high school and they don't have the wherewithal to uh, know where uh, they can go to college under which conditions. So we're inventing a program uh, for more recreational spending in this bill. Uh, government recreational spending ostensibly uh, to find some more uh, union employees to contribute to the Democrat party is what I gather. I, I don't know why else, Representative O'Neill, there would be such a wasteful uh, provision in this bill. Um, but uh, Mr. Speaker, would Representative O'Neill yield for a question? Representative O'Neill, she will yield. Representative Dreskowski. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Representative O'Neill, you seem to have the most information about the federal money uh, that has been sent to, Mins to not Minsky, but Minnesota State and the U of M uh, in the last year. Is there, can you elaborate on what you have or what you don't have and 
and through the committee process, have uh, have those institutions been forthcoming to the legislature about that money and where they're spending it? Or uh, do we have government uh, playing hide the ball and uh, give us our money over here while we figure out what we're going to do with the federal money type of thing? Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Representative Droskowski. So we are now on our third package of federal money coming. And no, we did not get a presentation from Men State and the University of Minnesota as to how much money they had gotten from package one or package two. They did say that out of the money that they received, that 50% of it was passed through and went directly to students for student aid. They did not tell us what they spent the other money on. Um, I suppose you could imagine that going through COVID with all of this is incredibly challenging, uh, that they had to revamp just like K-12 system did, how they educated and distance learning and, and all of that. I can tell you that at the University of Minnesota, they did refund some of the students' uh, board, so the room and board costs. Uh, that was not an easy thing to come by, I have to say. There was one particular regent that broached that subject and was pushed back repeatedly. And then he finally made his case and the regent board was willing to give back that money to students where it belonged because they hadn't been allowed to use their dorm and be on campus. So I know that they incurred some cost to do that. But no, Representative Draskowski, I don't actually have those numbers. I, I wasn't, it, to my recollection, I don't believe we had a presentation that explained exactly what those numbers were. I'm not even sure how much in total that the state of Minnesota received in package one and package two from the federal government. So I'm afraid I'm gonna disappoint you today, Ms. Uh, Representative Draskowski, because I, I just don't have them either. Representative Draskowski. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Representative O'Neill. Representative O'Neill, you seem to have more information about this than anybody, and uh, it's, I, I find it rather frustrating that our Higher Education Committee, who is um, contemplating the future budget, uh, at least the state portion budget, of those two institutions, uh, doesn't have this in their hands. So, 550 some million dollars of federal money, that's four times, that's over four times the amount of the base increase included in this bill. And we don't know where that money's gone or what it's been used for. Members, let that sink in. The institutions that are asking the taxpayers of Minnesota for hundreds of millions of dollars $3.5 billion to start with, and then hundreds of millions of dollars on top of the base of the current year, and millions more on top of the actual spending for the current biennium. Over four times more than the increase in the base in this bill. And they won't tell us where the money's being spent. Members, that's reason enough to vote no on this bill. We should vote no on this bill and demand an accounting from the U of M and Minnesota State before we proceed further in providing any more funds for them. This is where the accountability begins to happen. Many of us have seen the University of Minnesota thumbing the nose at the, at the legislature out of their position of, of constitutional autonomy over the years, this is the only accountability that we have, yay or nay, or the amount of funding in the bill. And we don't have the wherewithal as an institution to say, show us where the federal money is. If we pass this bill without getting that accounting from those institutions, we are gonna further our reputation as a weak legislature, and this point cowering to the U of M and to Minnesota State, instead, we need an accounting from them before we move further. Members, Mr. Speaker, um, Chair Bernardi and others, thank you. And I encourage a no vote on this bill. 
to the author of the bill, the representative from Anoka, Representative Bernardi. Representative, you are muted again. There we go. Thank you very, very much, Mr. Speaker, and for your patience. Members, I appreciate the respectful debate today. And thanks again to our community members, our staff, and everyone who shared their stories with us, especially our students. Working together, we developed this bill to strengthen higher education opportunities for all Minnesotans across the state. Through this bill, we've offered strong measures for a new direction to lower cost, increase equity, and enhance the quality of education all Minnesotans deserve. Member, your yes vote makes a difference. Minnesotans will benefit from this bold higher education budget that puts our students and families first, serving them now and in the future. You are helping Minnesotans achieve their dreams and provide economic security for themselves and their families. You are helping Minnesota students so they can thrive and emerge stronger post pandemic. I ask for your support and green vote, vote for students across the state. The clerk will take the roll on the bill. Members voting remotely, please vote. Will the chief clerk call the names of those members who have not voted yet? Yes. Berg, aye. Bliss. Bliss, no. Bliss, no. Bo. Bo, no. Bo, no. Franzen. Franzen, no. Franzen, no. Gomez. Gomez. Green. Green, no. Green, no. Grossel. Grassel, no. Grassel, no. Haley. Haley, no. Hamilton. Hamilton, no. Hamilton, no. Hanson R. Hanson R, yes. Hanson R, I. Houseman. Houseman, I. Houseman, I. Heinrich. Heinrich, no. Heinrich, no. Katiza Watoon. Katiza Watoon, I. Katiza Watoon, I. Listagard. List Lagarde, aye. List Lagarde, aye. Mariani. Mariani, aye. Mariani, aye. Mason. Mason, aye. Mason, aye. McDonald. McDonald, nay. McDonald, no. Nash. Nash, no. Nash, no. Swazinski. Swazinski, no. Swazinski, no. Tice. Tice, aye. No, Tice, no. Tice, no. Thompson. Thompson, yes. Thompson, aye. Gomez. Gomez, aye. Gomez, aye. The clerk will close the roll. Oh, shut up.
There being 74 ayes and 59 nays, the bill is passed as amended and its title agreed to.